Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Daily Grace Podcast. This is Shelby, and I'm here as always with my friend and co-host, Crystal. Hey, Crystal. Hey, Shelby. And we have an amazing guest with us today that we're really excited to introduce you to. We have Kristen Wetherell here. Hey, Kristen. We're so glad to have you with us. Hello. It's so fun to be back with you. This is great. Oh, yes. We had a brief conversation. Gosh, it might have been a year and a half ago-ish on Instagram Live, but this is so much more fun. We get to have a longer conversation. We get to share it with more people. So we're super excited. Mm -hmm. Um, But Kristen is a pastor's wife. She is a mom to three. She is a writer and a speaker. When I read that line, I was like, that is a short sentence, but that's That's a lot lot. of stuff. (laughs) (laughs) You are a busy woman, Kristen. (laughs) And she's recently released a brand new book called Help for the Hungry Soul, Eight Encouragements to Grow Your Appetite for God's Word, which is what we've invited her here today to talk about. And I'm really excited to get into this conversation because we all struggle at times with a waning appetite for scripture. Um, I know I personally feel that at times. I don't think I've ever talked to someone who's like, no, I'm always passionate. I'm always ready to get into my Bible every Mm -hmm. single day. It's never a challenge. And so I think that this is going to be an encouraging topic for literally all of us, no matter what stage or season of life we're in. So I don't know, Kristen, this is just super exciting. Love this book. Love this topic. Excited to talk more about it. And I think what's really neat, too, for us when we get to do interviews like this, is like we want to provide content for our listeners, but we also have these questions for ourselves. And so I'm really mm-hmm. excited to get to ask some of these questions and just personally learn more from you. But before we get into it, will you just tell a little bit more um, about yourself? Sure. Well, I'm excited to talk about it because believe me, I'm not coming to this conversation from a place of having all the answers, you know, Um definitely walking this road alongside you and alongside the listeners in my own struggles. So I'm looking forward to this as well. Um, you know, we mentioned I'm a, I'm a pastor's wife. My husband and I uh, live in the Chicagoland area. We're members at the Orchard and he is the campus pastor here in Arlington Heights. Um, so we're very involved in our church. We are so grateful for that place. It has been such a place of grace, God's grace to us. And, um, and our three kids are enjoying the church as well. We have a six-year-old girl, three-and-a-half-year-old boy, and then a 10-month-old girl who's screaming behind me in the room <laughs> next to me. <laughs> so I was just joking with you ladies. I have my mother-in-law on call. Um, but yeah, our lives are just really full of, of um, day-by-day you know, plotting in the strength that God supplies and just mm-hmm. trying to be faithful mm-hmm. and put down roots. You know, we went through a season of our lives where things were changing a ton over like t- a 10-year period. And now this, it seems as though God is settling us. So what does it look like to put down roots Mm -hmm. and to be faithful to him each day, you know, looking to Jesus and, um, yeah, I'm just so delighted to do that with my family. It's been such a joy. And then on the side, I I get to write, which is such a privilege. I get to open God's word and, and, you know, ask him, Lord, what are you putting on my heart? What, what are you teaching me? And hopefully, um, by his grace, you know, the books are an overflow of what he's, of what he's teaching me. Mm, I love that. Man, what a good recap, like yeah. season of life you're mm-hmm. in, where you've been, where you're going, mm-hmm. what you're enjoying. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you wrote this book for people who feel guilty over or discouraged by their lack of desire for the Bible. And I know you mentioned that you experienced this as well, but I'm just wondering if you can share with us like maybe a specific instance or just in general when you've experienced that and and just how how that is to experience that lack of a desire for God's mm-hmm. word. Mm-hmm. Recently, <laughs> I, I walked through this, and and it's um it comes back. I feel like it's cyclical. Um, I've been a believer for a lot of my life. I don't remember a moment when I came to Christ. I just know that it was early on, and so you know, praise the Lord. I've been walking with Him for many years, and have been reading the Bible for for equally you know many years, and and yet it's cyclical. I find that I I get into ruts. I find that my heart is cold sometimes and really needs to be stirred up um, and it's affection for the word. So just recently, a few weeks ago, I was asking my husband and other friends to pray for me because I felt um, a bit dry, like the word was just a bit dry (laughs) coming to it. And I'm in a reading plan right now, which I love, but uh, I just kind of felt like, um, Lord, I'm just not, um, I'm not being affected by what I'm reading. 
And so honestly, it just led me to deep prayer and calling upon him to do what I very obviously could not do for myself Mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of us feel uh, guilt about this. You know, does this make me a bad Christian that I don't always have this fire in my heart for the word, but I think it's a very normal Christian experience. And um, the more we talk about it and the more we um, encourage one another and come up with creative ways to get in the word, I think the more spurred on we'll be to just keep coming and to keep mm-hmm. um, to keep seeking the Lord's face in his word, no matter what we're feeling. Mm-hmm. I think you bringing in other people is so important. I think it, it's tempting for us to isolate, to never talk about it. And then that desire, I feel like it's further and further away from us and we get more and more discouraged because no one else knows. And sometimes bringing it into the light, I think is where the Lord can really impact us and really draw us closer to, at least that's been the case for me when I mm-hmm. brought other people in. I feel like that's when my desire has started to grow um, because I don't feel shame. I don't feel isolated because I've brought other people in. And so I love even just that very simple example of like, I felt like the word was dry and I brought people in and I was able to pray and just making those just tiny steps of faith that, you know, you're, you're pursuing the Lord in that. So when it comes to our appetite for God's word, why do you think it's important for us to have a heart check before we pursue growth and change? Well, we can't uh, know how to get to where we're going unless we know where we are, right? I, I sometimes use this illustration when we're, when I'm talking about this, you know, in high school, my my high school teachers were bold enough to send a big group of us overseas to Europe. And they were there, you know, we had chaperones and whatnot, but a part of the trip was being dropped into cities in Italy. And we would have to find our way to the next destination. And back then we didn't have phones. So we had, you know, paper maps. Whoa. (laughs) And um, we could not figure out how to get to where we were going unless we knew exactly where we were on the map. And so it's important for us to, to know our hearts and to ask God to help us know our hearts um, in order to know how we can grow. Mm. And I sometimes am surprised by how little I know myself. Do you ever feel that way? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I don't really know my heart very well. And so I love, I love the psalmist prayer from Psalm 139. You know, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my anxious thoughts. Um, point out any grievous way within me. And then lead me to the way everlasting. And I think that's a prayer that all of us can pray. And, um, you know, by God's grace, whether it's through his word, by his spirit, or maybe through his people, people we trust to speak into our lives, um, over time, he'll be faithful to show us what's actually there and where we're struggling. Mm, Yeah, I think that that's so helpful. And I don't know if I've ever thought about that before in Mm. those seasons when I'm struggling to desire to be in the word, just thinking about like, hey, where where am I at right now? Like, let's just take a heart evaluation. So that's super helpful. Um, You know, you said something earlier to the effect of like, we can't make ourselves like desire God's word. Like the miracle of loving God's word is not something that we can muster up. Um, but why do we think that that is something that we should just like pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and, and make it happen? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I have my Bible right here. You know, opening the Bible and reading it is something that I do, right? It's not, it's not something that happens apart from me just through osmosis. It's, it's an action. And so naturally, I think that I can do this action on my own strength. And I think also where, you know, our hearts are naturally um, very cause and effect oriented, even kind of kind of uh, legalist by nature in the flesh. So if I do this, then this will happen is the way that we tend to think. Um, but the reality is, yes, this is a book, but it's not just a book. It's the living words of the living God. Mm. And these words are the food that our souls need to live. And when we think about that, it's actually quite astonishing what God has given to us as a wonderful gift. So the God of the universe um, who rules over everything, who we cannot see with our own two eyes, has um, graciously decided to speak to us in a form that we can see with our eyes and we can touch with our hands. Um, God speaks to us in a book, something as basic as that. And this was an insight that 
I, I got from John Piper, Pastor John Piper in his book, Reading the Bible Supernaturally. I was like, whoa, my mind was blown. I'd never really stopped to consider how wonderful that is and how gracious of God that it, uh, that is that he would give us his words in a book. So I think it's something that we um, we approach, you know, uh, as an active participant. And yet this is a supernatural act of the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit. And it's, you know, seeing what God wants us to see here in this word and even responding in in the help of his spirit. That's that's a spiritual thing. It's something that he has to work within us. Mm-hmm. So in that, let's talk about having a quiet time. I feel like that's always like a fun topic that everyone has like opinions on. Like we should always have a quiet time. We should never have a quiet time. It should be like all day. I just feel like everyone has such opinions on what that means because a lot of us feel this guilt when we try to have a quiet time and then maybe we, it doesn't look exactly. Maybe your child is crying in the background. And so it ends up being five minutes, whatever it is. It doesn't yeah. look how we want it to look. Right. So where did this concept come from and why do we feel such guilt around the concept? Yeah. I'm so glad that we're talking about this because I know the Daily Grace Company wants to support people's time with the Lord, what we call quiet time. Right. Um, and yet this idea of quiet time, like you're saying, Crystal, it's actually a Christian cultural idea. It's not a biblical command. When we stop to consider what God commands in his word about his word and spending time with him, there is no command like you shall arise at 5 a.m. with coffee in your Romans 828 mug (laughs) and, you know, spend time with me uninterrupted for two hours. There's no command like that. And um, this idea of quiet time is a construct that we've created, which is not a bad thing. We should be spending time with the Lord. And yet God's command is much, it's much broader and it frees us up. It's better. His command is love the Lord, your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. It's abide in me and I in you. And what this looks like pursuing God with all of our hearts could look like a million different things for different people. Um, And so I think we'll be really freed up from false guilt. The guilt that says, oh, you know, I'm not obeying this particular command. We'll be freed up from that false guilt because there is no command like that. When we realize that God just wants our hearts. And if, if that means I'm sitting down with my four-year-old who got up a little earlier than I would have liked, and she's going to read with me, or it means that I'm, you know, turning on the audio Bible in my car while I commute to work rather than reading it, that's great, right? It means that I'm pursuing time with the Lord and that's what he wants. He wants our hearts. Mm-hmm. I love that. I'm wondering if you can give us some examples, because I do think that women have a hard time imagining what a quiet time could look like if it's not, like you said, sitting down with your coffee mug in your Mm -hmm. journal at 5 a.m. And like, that's not me. Like, I I can't do that. I'm more of an evening person um, for my quiet time. And so, so I've said that before. And people will like come up to me and be like, I heard you say you do your quiet time in the evening. I do too. <laughs> it's like a, it's like they like don't want to say it out loud. They're like, I do too. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I'm just wondering, like, women, I think have this question a lot. Like, what what could it look like if it doesn't have to look like that? What could it look like? So I know you just gave us a couple of examples, but I don't know if you have just any mm-hmm. more guidance on that of like, hey, what does it look like to love the Lord? Yes, I'm so glad that you asked. Um, this has been really helpful for my small group. So we're a group of moms of young kids. So we're all in a very similar season of life. And we all feel this guilt and this sense of lament over, oh, I'm just not, you know, getting in the word like I want to or like I'm supposed to. Um, but the irony occurred to me after we met one week that the thing that we were lamenting, we were doing together. Right then and there, we were talking about God's word. And so the key, the key to quiet time really is meditation on God's word, right? We want to be thinking about what we're reading, what we're learning of him, chewing it, you know, think about this concept of being hungry and food. We're chewing on the word. We're um, getting all of its nutrients. We're really taking it into our hearts so that God will use it to change us and it will stick with us throughout the rest of the day. So that's kind of the method, but how you use the method 
could be so broad and creative. So we talked about, you know, listening to the Bible rather than reading. What if you did it with a friend? What if, you know, the next time I'm in the mom world, so I'll use another mom example. What if the next time you had a mom and their kids over, you guys, you know, read three verses in the gospel of John that would take you 30 seconds and just talked about it for a couple minutes. That's actually, that's meditation. It's not quiet because <laughs> you probably have kids screaming in the background, but it doesn't have to be perfectly quiet. Um, a friend of mine, Glenna Marshall has suggested printing out a portion of the Bible and putting the piece of paper in a gallon sized baggie, zipping it up, turning it upside down and taping it on your shower door. Because her point is you shower every single day. And so why not look at God's word and meditate on it while you're doing that thing that you always do. So pairing God's word with other habits that you have, um, can kind of stack them and make, make it sticky. Um, another example of that would be, is there a place that you visit in your house every single day? Uh, like the kitchen sink, maybe you're doing dishes or maybe it's your desk at work. Can you post scripture, something that you're trying to memorize and, um, memorization is a form of meditation. So the more we try and memorize God's word, you know, the more we're taking it into ourselves. Are your kids trying to memorize scripture for school, for church, for their Awana program? Memorize it along with them. Mm -hmm. Talk about it with them. Um, and when you have the opportunity to be in a quiet place, take it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the quiet time because I think quiet is definitely more conducive for prayer and talking back to God in response to his word. Um, but it doesn't have to be limited to that. The most important Thing that we can do is value the time that we have with our church family. So I mentioned my small group earlier, but um, feasting with our church on a Sunday morning, or perhaps it's a Saturday night is one of the main ways that we can nourish our souls and it's built in. So if you didn't get to your quiet time that day, you know, consider, consider the worship service a gift to you. Yeah. Or if you're going back that week to, th to consider the sermon again with your small group, that's a gift to you. And we can just be thankful for that and um, enjoy God's word in those creative ways. I really hope women are hearing this and experiencing just like burdens being lifted and feeling free. Because if I am not having a quiet time and then I go into a church service, I actually feel worse sometimes, <laughs> or I almost feel like I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And now I'm here at church and I just like feel this guilt when it should be the opposite. We should remember the freedom that we have in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so even as you're explaining just the normal rhythms of everyday life and you can bring God's word into it, I just pray that's an encouragement. I mean, it's encouragement for me. So I mm -hmm. hope it's an encouragement for anyone listening. Yeah. And just to add to that, you know, I've definitely had seasons where I, we had it just a couple of weeks ago where multiple kids were sick. We had so much going on in my quiet time was whatever, whenever, however, you know, and I remember just mm -hmm. in that season being like, Ugh, this is like, I don't like this and feeling that guilt. Mainly mm -hmm. it was guilt, you know, and I would say false guilt. But one day I just had a total shift and I was like, man, I'm focusing so much on what I was unable to do today, but what was I able to mm -hmm. do today? And I was like, what a gift that the minute my kids were in bed, my mind went to, oh, better like turn on my Bible reading while I pick up everything and get everything ready for tomorrow. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, that's what I was able that's to do. Great. And like, yeah. that's amazing. And I'm so thankful, you yeah. know, rather than flipping on a podcast or something else that is like, wow. God's yeah. word was there and it, might, it was top of mind. And yeah. so uh, I think, yeah, just focusing on what we can do and what we can't do can also be really helpful. Um, Kristen, another question for you. I, this is a struggle I find within myself. Like I, my whole job, right, is telling people that God's word will change your life and that you should be in it and that you should be meditating on it. Yet I forget, like I can say these truths all day long and then I can go home and like forget how precious it is and how important it is and how vital it is for me. And so like how, why is it that it's so easy to forget how precious God's word is? Yeah. We've already touched on the human heart. We're forgetful people. How many times in scripture is God saying, remember, <laughs> remember, don't forget. Um, we're forgetful people. And so it's so easy for us to, to slip into self-sufficiency. Um, 
We're also, you know, our desires have been corrupted by sin. And so they're not what they ought to be. Why is it that it, it feels more desirable for me to open my phone again than to run to God's word sometimes? It's just because my desires are all convoluted. And Jesus is in the, is in the uh, business of, you know, renewing my desires and changing that. But it's going to be a struggle on this earth. So we're dealing with the human heart. We're dealing with desire. Um, and we're also dealing with a pervasiveness of resources that can cause us to take the Bible for granted mm. and to forget how precious it is because it's everywhere all the time. Um, it's helpful actually to think about the fact that people just several centuries ago did not have Bibles, personal Bibles that they owned. Um, they were reliant on the church's teaching, particularly, you know, before the Reformation, the Catholic church's teaching, and they did not have Bibles on their coffee tables and on their bookshelves and in their side table drawers. I mean, think about it. We go to a hotel and you have a Bible in every single side table drawer. Um, but back then people did not have that. So how did they receive the word? It was through teaching. It was through oral tradition. Um, and then with the invention of the printing press, you know, Bibles became a thing and yet they were very expensive. So unless you were wealthy and you could afford to purchase a Bible, you still did not own them. Fast forward, you know, a few hundred years and you have Bibles in every single house, free Bible resources online. And I think that the pervasiveness of these resources can um, cause us to forget how precious they really are. Um, as we mentioned before, that we don't deserve that God will reveal himself to us when we have rejected his word and pushed him away. And yet he's been so kind to meet us in, in the Bible every single day and to speak to us. And so I think we forget what a privilege revelation is. We forget what a privilege it is to have the resource of this book. Um, and I think remembering that will help us. It will, it will humble us right to, to how we have forgotten. And it will cause us to say, you know, Lord, help me to treasure what a, what a precious gift my, you know, my Bible is. Mm. I love that. There's one thing that you wrote in your book and it says, when you engage with God's word, more is happening than what you can see. So just hearing that statement, how can someone listening who maybe is feeling jaded or apathetic, discouraged, maybe even doubtful, how can this encourage them when they come to scripture? Hmm. Well, again, we can come to scripture and we come to scripture. So it's an action and it can sometimes feel like, well, wait, I'm doing this thing, you know, money into the machine. Why is the gumball not popping out? Why, <laughs> why isn't something very obviously happening right now? And I have been so encouraged um, to remember that this is a walk of faith and not a walk of sight, right? So I'm, I'm walking with my eyes fixed on Jesus and trusting that the unseen work of God through his Holy Spirit is um, going to bear fruit in my heart. I like to think of it as a tree in the wintertime. So I'm looking out my window right now and the leaves are still hanging on a bit. They're beautiful, but they're falling off these trees. And before I know it, these trees are going to look desolate. They're going to look dead. But the reality is that even in the winter time, there is life in the roots of these trees. And there is a work, a deep work going on that I cannot see. And when springtime comes, the fruit will be born. And the leaves will, um, you know, the leaves will bud again, the blossoms will erupt and it will be beautiful. And I've often encouraged my own heart with that when I can't see an immediate work of God, because <laughs> the work of God is often slow and unseen. There is still life in the roots. And that's why it's so important for us to nourish our souls in the word. Mm -hmm. um, there will be seasons of our lives when Suffering comes and we need a firm foundation on which to stand. There are going to be other people in our lives, whether it's our spouses or our children or our brothers and sisters at church, who are going to need our store of the treasuries of God's word when their faith is weak. And we can build them up with, with the strength that God has supplied to us through his word. Um, so those are a few things that have encouraged me when I have felt doubtful, is God doing anything? What is all of this for? 
um, is to remember that he's doing more that I can see with my, with my own two eyes and that this is a walk of faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. That is super encouraging. Um, you know, you've mentioned community a few times in this. And so I'm wondering for people listening in who are maybe going through a season where the Bible feels dry or maybe their schedule is hectic and, and they're just struggling for one reason or another to have an appetite for scripture. How is the local church, how does it play into that? And how is that God's primary provision for our spiritual hunger? Yes, it's a it's a great question. Um, so important for us to think about because I think we often discount the place of our local church in the nourishment of our souls. It can can feel like a routine that we complete every week, um, a building that we enter. But what is the church? It's the living, breathing body of Christ. And the body of Christ needs to be nourished in order to grow and thrive. So what is the way that the body of Christ is nourished? It's the same answer as the way that we're nourished. It's the word of Christ being, being spoken through the power of the Holy spirit. Um, and honestly, this is a challenge for those, you know, for those people listening who are maybe not at a church who have not committed themselves to a local church. Um, friend, you, you need the church and the church needs you. And if you are disconnected, um, you know, maybe be asking the Lord to lead you to a church where your soul will be nourished and unfortunately, not not all churches are counted as equal in that way. I think a primary question we can ask is, you know, is the word of God, the word of Christ, the scriptures at the center of the worship service? Because there's a difference, right? When our worship services are centered around stories or, um, you know, music that's more about us and our emotions than about God in a worship service that is deeply rooted in the word of Christ, where it's dwelling richly in us. Um, you know, we sing the word of Christ through, through songs that are um, based in the word and that are maybe hymns, you know, that are written in old traditions. We read the word of Christ together. We hear the word of Christ preached through the pastor and um, many other forms of this. The sacraments are the word of Christ put on display for us. And so, um, I think we another thing we discount is church, right? It can just feel like this normal thing that we just do. But God has given it to us to nourish our souls. And so it's good for us to commit and to um, to be involved and to be encouraged as we go each week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good encouragement. We're always, always hoping that in every episode we're pointing people towards the local church um, because you need the church, just like mm-hmm. you said, um, and the church needs you. That's a great point. Um, Okay, let's get just like super practical for a second. Maybe there's someone who's listening in and their appetite for God's word has been low. Maybe they've still been opening their Bible every day or maybe they haven't. Um, Just what really practical next steps could you give them? Like where can they go from here to increase their appetite for God's word? Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked. Someone years back... um, ministered to me in this way because I was in that spot, just feeling like I'm stuck. I don't know how to change things. Um, but I think that's the answer. I think it's to change things up. I think we get in ruts where we're doing kind of the same routine every single time, or for some people, maybe you haven't been in the word for a long time. And so you're just overwhelmed at the thought of where to even begin. Um, so for the, for the first person, you're stuck in a rut. What do I do? Change things up. Um, I often encourage people to speed up, or slow down. (laughs) So speed up. Maybe you've been, um, you know, just kind of looking at small portions of scripture at a time, a verse a day or something. Try reading through a whole book of the Bible in one sitting. Just take that challenge. Pick a small book of the Bible and, um, you know, maybe something with three or four chapters and read the whole thing and see what God does through that. Or maybe that's you and you're flying through your Bible reading plan every day, reading five chapters at a time. Maybe you need to slow down. Maybe you need to pick out a small portion of scripture and ask the spirit to just help you meditate on that. So speed up or slow down. Um, If you're reading by yourself, maybe read with another person that can be so helpful for gaining insight and encouragement. Um, And I think that that applies to the person who doesn't know where to start team up, you know, go to, go to someone who maybe you feel has a better grasp on, 
on scripture and ask them, hey, would you read along with me? Because I don't really know where to start. Um, you don't need to be ashamed of that. I'm sure that your that your friend or sister or brother in Christ would be happy to help you with that. Um, another thought for the person who doesn't know where to start is just start small. Don't, uh, you know, don't set your clock an hour earlier and expect to spend two hours the very first time. Just make small deposits because the small deposits add up. Maybe it's setting your alarm five minutes earlier and, um, you know, reading for five minutes or 10 minutes and then responding in prayer for a minute or two. But I think um, starting small is, is a good way to not feel overwhelmed and discouraged. So those are some practical thoughts right off the top of my head. Yeah, love that. Super practical and encouraging. I always like to leave people with that at the end. Um, you know, Kristen, one more question for you. And this is our favorite question to ask. <laughs> it's a question that we ask every single guest on the podcast. But at the Daily Grace Co., we always say that the gospel changes everything. And Kristen, we would love to know what has the gospel changed for you? Mm. Is it cliche to say it's changed my heart? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um <laughs> Yeah, the two words that come to my mind are the the gospel of Christ. Jesus has freed me from self-sufficiency and from selfishness. Um, I have always been a very determined (laughs) type A person, which can serve really well. But the Lord has um, freed me from a self-sufficient spirit by teaching me that by works of the law, no being is justified in God's sight. It's only by faith in Christ. And man, I think about where I might be if he had not rescued my heart from that trap of self-sufficiency. And I think I'd be, you know, a whole lot more exhausted. I still struggle with it, but a whole lot more exhausted depleted of joy and peace. And I think the selfishness part of it, you know, the daily struggle for me is just the struggle for pride as it is for all of us in different ways. But I am just so grateful that God, um, that he looks to the lowly one and that he exalts the humble. And I think if he had not rescued me, um, I would be in a place of just really loving myself and what a destructive place that that is. And what a freeing place it is to to know that Christ has first served me. The God of the universe has first come to serve me. And now I am freed up from self-service to serve other people and to serve him ultimately. So those are the two words that come to mind, self-sufficiency and selfishness. But I'm just so grateful that he died for me and that he gives me life and that I don't have to look to myself anymore, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but to him. It's just such good news. Yeah, it is good news. I always love hearing people's answers to that. And it is always an encouragement again to myself to remember the way that the gospel has transformed my own heart. Mm -hmm. Also a prayer, you know, just that God would continue to work Mm -hmm. in and, and transform my life. And so, man, thank you for sharing that, Kristen. Thank you so much for being here today. You know, my biggest takeaway from my conversation is to not give in to that false guilt Mm -hmm. um, when I'm in a season where maybe I'm feeling not as strongly about God's word or it's not looking the way that I want it to look. And so really thank you for having this conversation. I thank you for encouraging us. You'll be sure to find all the links to connect with Kristen and to find this book. And she has some other books too, which are great in the show notes. Um, But Kristen, just thank you for being with us today. This was a pleasure. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It was a joy. All right, guys. Well, you can subscribe to the podcast newsletter also in the show notes to stay up to date with all things Daily Grace podcast. You can also join us over on Instagram until our next episode, but we will see you next week. Bye.